Let me pray for us before we come to these passages. Father God, we thank you very much that you are a speaking God. And you have willed to speak to us today, personally, intimately, right where we're at, through the reading and preaching of your word. So I pray, Father, that by your spirit you'd give us humble hearts uh, to receive what you've got for us over this really important area of human sexuality, um, to receive it as good news um, and to live in light of it. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. So, so today is the second of three talks in a short sermon series looking at human sexuality, and particularly so in light of General Synod, which is the governing body of the Church of England. They're meeting next week, Monday to Wednesday. They're going to be making some important decisions around issues of human sexuality. Last week, we looked at the culture's view of sexuality, predominantly through the sexual revolution and where it's led us over the past 60 years. And we saw that overall, the damage that has been done to us both on an individual and a societal level. If you did miss last week, I would encourage you to catch up with it online as these three talks very much go as one uh, series. Uh, Today we're going to be looking at the biblical view of sexuality, what God says on it, and I'm really keen that we all see why it is such good news for us wherever we're coming from today. And then next week we'll look practically about how to live this out, ourselves as a church, in the world. So a cultural view last week, biblical view today, practical view uh, next week. And as we come to the biblical view today, straight off the bat, what I want to do is make, which is probably a very obvious point to you, but I think a really important point. And that is that when it comes to the person who lies right at the heart of the Christian message and the message of the Bible, Jesus Christ, he himself was single throughout his entire life. Celibate, never got married, never had sex. And so in a culture that we live in today, a hypersexualized culture, a culture which says sex is the be-all and end-all, in Jesus' life, we have offered to us something even better, more fulfilling. And the question I have for us today is, you know, do we know what that is? Do we have an experience of that ourselves? Do we know, could we articulate to each other why God's word and God's good news it, on sexuality, it is such good news for us. Could we, could we share that, as a, give a better story to our friends, our colleagues, those around in the world, with a very strong message coming at them, which is very opposed to what God says. This is what we're going to be looking at today. And such an important subject for so many reasons, and not least if we have some humility here as, as, as Christians and followers of Jesus, that the church leadership, more generally, sort of out there and across the world has, has failed in this area a lot in matters of sexuality. The fact that those with experience of same-sex attraction are often made to feel very unwelcome in the church at times. And actually, for us in a church culture, and I'm not sure what you'd say about us here, are often one that can idolize marriage to the neglect to those who are single. So a really important subject for us uh, today. I was struck by a comment I read um, this week by Danielle Troik. She's author of the recently released book, The Meaning of Singleness. And she suggests this. Evangelical churches and Christian leaders of recent decades have held out an anemic theology of singleness, an idealized theology of marriage, and a very much underbaked theology of church as family. And all of this poor theology, she says, has led to poor and even damaging pastoral practice. Now, I don't know if you would agree with that statement or not, but I don't want us to be a church like that, and I certainly don't want to be a leader like that. And my hope and prayer for today's talk, at least, is that it would give us, a, God would give us through his word, a richer, more vibrant theology of singleness and marriage and a deeper understanding and grasp and appreciation of why what he says in sexuality is the best news for us all. So let's take a look at it now. Uh, again, there'll be the Slido link up on the slides. If you go on Slido, sli.do, event code sexuality, feel free to ask any questions um, or comments that you have as we bear that in mind for next week's talk and practically how to live it out. Now, the way it's going to work um, today is this. What I want to do is spend most of our time looking at a biblical overview of human sexuality. 
So that's from Genesis, first book of the Bible, right through to Revelation, the last bit. We're going to do the whole Bible story. Theologians often split it up into four parts, creation, full, redemption, new creation. That's what we're going to do. And then towards the end, we'll draw out two main implications for us today. So we're covering a lot of ground. I hope you're ready, 4 p.m., Sunday afternoon. promise not to go too fast, but here we go. Okay, first of all, biblical overview. We're going to start with creation. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning. We're going to go back to the book of Genesis, back when God created everything, created humanity in his own image. I know some people today doubt Genesis or can be skeptical of how much is uh, literal, how much we can take for us today. So let's go to Jesus in Matthew 19, who himself takes the book of Genesis very seriously indeed as God's word for us today. And in Matthew 19, when he's answering this question around divorce and the lax view of divorce in the Old Testament law, he says, hey, look, go back to Genesis. Let's look at God's ideal. And he tells us about marriage and sex within marriage and everything we need to know today. So if you've closed your Bibles, do open them on page 986. I'd love for us to look at this together so you see that where this is coming from, from Scripture, from Jesus' words, and certainly not from mine. But in verse 4, we read this, Jesus speaking, Haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Now, this is fascinating. Because Jesus here does not only quote from Genesis chapter 2, our first reading, and affirm everything that Genesis teaches around marriage between being a gift of God in creation, and about marriage being where man and woman come together in the joy of sexual union, two becoming one flesh, and from that one flesh, the procreation of children, and marriage is the bedrock of society. Not only does he affirm all that from Genesis 2, did you notice he also quotes from Genesis 1 just before, and so he's tying these two quotes together to make a specific point that marriage has always been, right from the beginning, in God's ideal, the bodily union of two sexually different people, male and female. Now let's make sure that we all see this. Do you notice the word for in verse 5? As Jesus links these two quotes together, at the beginning, Jesus says, God our creator made us male and female. So that in God's original design, sex really is binary. That we are not assigned our sex at birth by a doctor, we are assigned, humanity is assigned sex, male and female, at the beginning. And if we're unsure what it is, male and female, again, God tells us, Genesis 1, verse 20, Genesis 2, verse 7, we're told that the Lord God forms the man from the dust of the ground and then breathes into his nostrils the breath of life and the man becomes a living being. In other words, every human being is this glorious unity of body and soul. That our sex bodies play a vital role in revealing to ourselves and to others who we really are. Are. When Adam sees Eve for the first time, he just sees her in all her bodily glory, and he's like, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she should be called woman, for she was taken out of man. So there is similarity, flesh and bones. They are like each other. They are also different to each other, woman and man. And God has perfectly designed the two sex bodies, male and female, to perfectly fit back together again in a unique way for the procreation of children and the flourishing of the human race. Therefore, Jesus says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is what God's design has always been from the very beginning and for you today. And one thing that's really striking, if you've ever read um, chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis, uh, the opening chapters of the creation account, is just the sheer joy and wonder and harmony and order and wholeness and goodness there is. God speaks, he creates, it's good. Humanity, the day six, the pinnacle of creation. God makes us in his own image, male and female. God saw everything he made and it was very good. Everything as it's meant to be. Why is it that the National Sex Survey in the US showed that those who had the most enjoyable sex were those in committed marriages and felt the most cherished and loved 
by their spouses? Why is it that multiple studies show a solid, intact family structure has significantly positive impacts on a child's present and future well-being and offers countless benefits for both adults and children? Why is it that the only long-term study into surgical reassignment after gender-affirming care actually shows a 20-fold increase in suicidality after transition? Because as human beings, made in the image of God, we flourish when we are working with and for and not against God's good design in creation. Now, that's the ideal. That's part one of the Bible overview. That's how it was in the beginning at creation. But that is not where we are now as humanity. Things go spectacularly wrong very quickly. And this is part two of the biblical overview, what Christian theologians call the fall. And in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve, they doubt the goodness of God in in creation. They doubt the goodness of his gift and the way he's made them. And they decide to go against what he says rather than with them and for them and with devastating consequences. In Genesis 3, we're told that the serpent is cursed, the ground is cursed. Interestingly, we're not told that Adam and Eve themselves were cursed, but we are shown the consequences of their actions. Pain in childbirth, work becomes stressful, death becomes a certainty. I think we can all agree with that. And then also, in verse 16 of Genesis 3, we read, Eve's desire from now on will be contrary to her husband, And he will rule over her. And so where there was harmony and order and wholeness in Genesis 1 and 2, now in Genesis 3 there is conflict. There is a battle of the sexes. And there is oppression. And there is domination. And there is sexual violence. And people today, they think that what freedom means is freedom from God. No, no, no. This is where freedom from God leads. And we saw a lot of the Devastating consequences of that last week as we observed what came out of the sexual revolution. Because of human sin, because of a lack of trust in God's goodness for us, going against rather than with, everything is now broken. Humanity's relationship with God is broken. Our relationship with each other is broken. Conflict, our relationship with creation, the ground cursed, work is stressful, even within ourselves. Things are twisted and distorted and broken. Why do we lust after people we're not married to? Why are divorce rates so high in this country? Why are some people born with sexual attraction to those of the same sex? Why do some people feel just so uncomfortable in their own body? It is all a consequence of the fall. As Adam and Eve turn from God's goodness, go their own way, we all come from Adam and Eve. We're all victims in this. We're all villains in this. As humanity as a whole turns its back on God's good design in creation. You sometimes hear people say, look, I was born this way, and if God made me this way, surely any desires I have are are good ones, and to act on them is a good thing. How could that possibly be wrong, especially when it feels so strong inside? Now, that would be all well and true, that way of thinking, if we were still in the Garden of Eden, if there was still all the order and wholeness and goodness and God's forever, all he'd make was very good. We're not there anymore. We now live after the fall. And we're all broken, every single one of us. In the way we think and act, our desires, our sexual brokenness. We have mixed motives. We have good desires, bad desires. And those bad desires, which go contrary to God's goodness in creation, if we act on them, it's always going to lead to more pain, more suffering, more guilt, more shame, more conflict. And that's why there's so much stigma often attached to this conversation around sexuality because unlike Adam and Eve in the garden where they were both naked and they felt no shame, how you and I, we clothe ourselves and cover up 
and we still feel this shame inside. And as we go through the rest of the Old Testament, from Genesis 3 you know, through to Malachi, we see time and time again, with the nations, with God's own people, there is nothing we can do ourselves to repair this brokenness, nothing we can do to make ourselves clean again, nothing we can do to return to this ideal. This is the fall. This is part two. Here's the good news, by the way, if you're feeling a bit low now. That's not the end of the biblical story. There's a part three. There's redemption. There is one person who can help, can repair, can redeem, can bring us back to the deal. The arrival of Jesus Christ on earth. God himself, born into our world. Who took on flesh and bones. Who took on a sexed body. Who was tempted in every way, we're told in Hebrews 4.15. And that includes all sexual temptation. And yet was without sin. So Jesus Christ is the one person to live a perfectly pure life. In thought and word and desires and deed. And what's he do at the end of his life? He chooses willingly, amazingly, lovingly to give up his life for us. For humanity. To die on a cross. Ephesians 5 describes him as a perfect husband. Giving up his life for us to wash away our sin. To cover with his righteousness all the shame and guilt of our sexual brokenness. To make us holy, radiant, without spot, wrinkle. So that his body, the church, would be like a virginal bride on the wedding day. And he will marry her for all time. Joe and I watched the talented Mr. Ripley this week. It's about a con artist, if you've not seen it. Who thinks it's better to be a fake somebody than a real nobody. And so he ends up doing some truly, truly awful things. But he finds someone that he wants to be real with that he wants to open up to, that he wants to let the light in, clean everything up, and tragically he can't. And in one of the key scenes where he's face to face with this person, he says these words, don't you just take the past and put it in a room in a basement and lock the door and never go in there again. That's what I do. And then you meet someone special and all you want to do is toss them the key and say, open up, step inside but you can't because it's dark, because there's demons. Because if anybody saw how ugly it all is. Friends, I want you to know that when it comes to Jesus Christ, you can always open up to him. You can always toss him the key. You can always invite him inside, no matter the darkness that is in there, that we're all holding on to in our own ways, because he sees us. He sees us in all our darkness and he still says, I have come to earth to love you, to die for you, to wash you clean and to never let you go. Did you know that just a few verses later in Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul quotes from Genesis 2 this key seminal text around marriage. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. But do you know what he says next? In light of the coming of Jesus Christ and what he has done for humanity on the cross, he says this, this is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Now, do you know what that's saying? That's saying that at the end of the day, there is only one marriage in the universe that matters and lasts And it is not any earthly human marriage. But the ultimate eternal union and marriage between Christ and the church of which every earthly marriage is just a temporary pointer and sign to. In other words, we ultimately, we're not made for sex. We are made for Jesus Christ and relationship with him. So come to him, whether you're single, married, celibate, divorced, widowed, experienced same-sex attraction, or gender dysphoria. Come to the one who will truly love you, forgive you, transform you, beautify you, and never let go of you for all eternity.
I wonder if this is our view of who Jesus is and what he came to do. Because there's no one else like him. There's no other relationship like this. And this is what part three of the biblical story is. Redemption. And that's not the end. There's a part four. It gets even better. There's a new creation to come. When there's the end of all our sexual brokenness and struggle in this life. And everything that is wrong is put right. Just listen to these words from Revelation. So we're now at the final book of the Bible. We've gone through it from Genesis to Revelation. Here is chapter 21. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. That is a description of the church on the final day. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. This is the Christian hope. This is where we're all heading towards. Christ and the church. This perfect marriage to come. There's so much pain in this life, so much struggle, so much temptation, battling unwanted desires. But one day it will all come to an end. All the brokenness repaired once for all. The resurrection of Christ guarantees it. And the joy, the wonder, the harmony, the order, the wholeness, the beauty, the goodness of God's design in creation, we'll experience it afresh in the new creation. Resurrected bodies, harmony and unity again, body and soul. Renewed heavens and earth. Relationship with God and with one another, all of God's people, just as it was originally intended to be. That is God's good news for our sexuality. So next week, we are going to think in more detail about how to live this all out. For the rest of our time here, I want to draw out two main implications for us. First, for marriage, and then for singleness. First, for marriage. I hope we can see that the traditional Christian sexual ethic around marriage and sex within marriage is not based on some cultural hang-up wanting to go to the trad wife 1950s. It's not based on a few proof texts from the Old Testament law. This is something beautiful that we see from the start of Genesis and the human marriage all the way through to Revelation and the final ultimate marriage. The traditional Christian sexual ethic, it is based upon the greatest love story in the universe, God's love for his people, consummated in Jesus Christ, with a beautiful vision on the final day, better than any Hollywood ending, because this is genuine and true and real, and it is truly inclusive, because every single person in the planet can be a part of this marriage if they trust in Jesus Christ. And every earthly marriage is a pointer to it. That's why God gave us. This is a profound mystery. I'm talking about Christ and the church. Why is it that human marriage has to be monogamous, the bridegroom and a bride? Because it points forward to the ultimate monogamous marriage between Christ and the church, the bridegroom and the bride. Why is it that marriage has to be between two sexually different people, male and female, this union of difference, this wonderful coming together again, because it points forward to the ultimate union of difference between Christ and the church? Why does human marriage have to be lifelong, faithful, committed? Because it points forward to the eternal love and faithful commitment of Christ to us, his bride, for all time. And so in terms of general synod coming up this week, we have seen marriage is, well, first of all, we can see how serious this all is, but marriage is not a human invention that can be twisted or distorted with the prevailing winds of culture. Marriage is a gift of God in creation. And therefore, any twisting of it, turning from it, either breaking the union between a man and a woman, breaking the union of sex within marriage, is always going to lead to pain and suffering and difficulty, even if we are unable to see how. So please, please join with me in praying for repentance and a return to God's good ideal in Scripture for marriage and sex within marriage at General Synod 
this coming week. And do grab me afterwards if you have any questions about that. I'd love to talk to you if you do. Secondly, an implication for singleness. And as I make this implication, I'm talking to every member of the church family here, whether you're married or not, single or not. Because of what we've just seen about the whole Bible story on sexuality, its ultimate purpose, to point forward to the eternal union between Christ and the church, the one ultimate marriage that matters. That means there is an intrinsic goodness to singleness now. There is an intrinsic goodness to singleness now, not least because of its powerful witness to this future reality in a wholehearted devotion to the Lord. Let me read from Barry Dunalak in his book, Redeeming Singleness. He writes this. When people choose to remain single for the sake of the kingdom of God, because they recognize that their true sufficiency is found only in their relationship in Christ and the coming of his kingdom, and they orientate their lives around this conviction, they become in their singleness visible signs of this coming age. That's a beautiful thing. I mean, we talk a lot, don't we, about marriage being a pointer to the future reality, the new age to come. How often do we speak of singleness being a pointer to that future too? It's fascinating because when I think personally about the person who's helped me the most in this, particularly reflecting upon what it means for Christ's love for the church, his bride, and his corporate love for us, the person who's helped me the most in this is a lady called Jane Jealous, who's a member of the 11M, a member of the church from me, a single lady. She sent me a text just the other day. I've asked her for permission to share it here this evening. I was asking her on this very question. And she says this, reflecting what it means for me personally that the church is Christ's dearly beloved bride and makes me love and value my fellow Christians more, makes me realize it's not all about me individually but us collectively. It's such a safe feeling to be a member of something much bigger than me brought at such a great cost. Makes me hopeful for the future and able to deal with the individual vicissitudes of my life because I know they are part of something much bigger and grander than my personal comfort and I can trust the Lord that they are working for our good. It's a wonderful privilege to be part of the body of Christ that also makes me feel so safe and loved. It just feels much more right and in proportion. It's all about the church, not just me. I give thanks to God for Jane Jealous. I give thanks to God for every member of the church family here who in their singleness are these visible signs of this future reality to come and a wholehearted devotion to the Lord. And I hope that we as a church can think really seriously about not just the way we celebrate and honor marriage, which we do, but how do we celebrate and honor in an appropriate way those who are single? Because we need each other. Because we're on this journey together to this eternal union between Christ and the church and each of us are pointers to it. So how can we do this as a church together? Marriage is good. Singleness is good. It's all pointing us to Christ and the church. Look, that's not to say that there can't be real pain and real heartache in singleness in this life. Just as there can be real pain and real heartache in marriage. And I know some of you are experiencing that too. But it is to say that there is an intrinsic goodness in both. So as we leave this evening, as we go into the week ahead, whether we are single or married, let me encourage us to come back to Jesus Christ. Let's grow deeper in our intimacy with him. Let's go deeper in our relationship with him because he is the one who uniquely unites us together as the bride, his bride. And he is the one who uniquely fulfills our deepest desires. So let me pray that for us now. Let's pray. Father God, we thank and praise you for the good news that you reveal to us in your word, the Bible, from start to finish when it comes to our sexuality. Thank you for revealing us your good design for it. Thank you for showing us where it's all gone wrong and the part we play in that. Thank you that that's not the end of the story that you've sent Christ, you love us that much and you want to redeem us make us part of the bride of Christ enjoy that final day, that marriage day between Christ, fellowship with you and each other for all eternity in this world renewed resurrection bodies, what a hope we have and so please, please would you help us to have a right perspective on marriage and a right perspective on singleness 
and how we need each other as we're pointing one another together to that final day. And we ask it for Jesus' sake.